What is your stake in Iowa's future? Iowa State University at Ames, through its Cooperative Extension Service, is helping 50,000 Iowans discuss this subject. The county extension offices have helped people organize into discussion groups and have provided free materials to help with the subject matter. The topics on the last two programs were What do freedom and democracy demand? And What does growth require? Our final discussion will be the next program on what prospects for families and communities. Today's topic is what prospects for agriculture and Main Street. In our studio to investigate the question, what prospects for agriculture and Main Street, we have a group of people representing various occupations. They'll be debating this topic in just the same way other small groups are doing in get-togethers all over Iowa. Meet those to take part in this interchange of opinion. Mr. Ralph Wilson, Vice President of the Securities Savings Bank at Marshalltown. Mrs. Lawrence Everett, a homemaker from New Sharon. Mr. Rex Roosh, a guidance counselor from Denison. Mr. Jack Bauschka, a farm operations student from Jackson Junction. And Mr. Cy Warland, a farmer from Fort Dodge. We now join the discussion on what prospects for agriculture and Main Street. I believe before we go any further in this discussion, we need to consider what the prospects are for our own community. Mrs. Everett, you are from New Sharon in Mahaska County, I believe. What do you feel about <coughs> prospects for an adequate living for farming and business in your area? Well, I think uh, this word adequate is very interesting because we all have a different idea in mind of what we mean by the word adequate. Um, I think uh, we cannot paint a completely rosy picture down our way. However, I would say this, that for those whose uh, intent it is to be in agriculture, those whose intent it is to be a good management person in small business can make their way in our area. It is possible to do so. Well, I think in Marshall County, like in uh, other counties, we've had a shrinkage in farms. In fact, in 1954, we had 2,151 farms in Marshall County, and in 1959, that had dropped to 1,974 farms, which means that a number of farmers are going to be displaced from the farms. We've been fortunate in that uh, we have good industry there in Marshall Town that's been able to absorb most of that uh, type of, uh, of workers. And uh, I think that it leaves us with a, a very healthy atmosphere, and uh, we, we've found this out in uh, checking over some figures the other day. We found out that the remainder of the farmers that are still on the farm must be in a little better shape than the previous ones on the average because we had 20% less loans to farmers at the end of this year than we did in 1959, which is a healthy sign. I think that's real interesting. I was wondering, Mr. Roosh and Dennison, uh, what's your feeling about the situation in your area? Well, we've had our problems out there. I think it's been more or less of a, oh, a mild social revolution that we're going through. We have the declining number of people on our farms. We have larger farms. Uh, sooner or later, I know, our, uh, if this continues, that our, our businessmen down on Main Street are going to sell less overshoes and less clothing, less groceries, less paint and wallpaper to people if they're not out there on the land. Now, we've lost several hundred farmers, and we may lose more. And I think we're concerned about it, and I think we all should be. Uh, fortunately, we've had uh, several packing houses start in our area, and uh, they've taken up some of the slack and employed some of these people, and that helps. From uh, our territory of the state, which is Northeast Iowa, primarily Winchy County, we have approximately the same problem, that being of uh, farmers uh, increasing in size and more people moving off the farm. Uh, this is uh, bad because uh, people who have to move off these farms have to go approximately 100 to 150 miles in order uh, to seek another job. It, this uh, therefore uh, reduces the size of the community considerably since there isn't a uh, any sizable industry to employ the people around. I think in our state, area of the state, up around Fort Dodge, uh, of course Fort Dodge, like a lot of other cities who are larger, <coughs> I believe 
uh, prospects are fairly good on Main Street. I think pro prospects in agriculture are, I think they're all right for the fellow who really wants to farm. I believe that uh, farming is going to be uh, still a pretty tough job for the next few years. It's going to take good efficiency and good management. I think the long run will be all right, but I think the fellow in the next few years has to really want to farm to stay uh, on the farm. I think this, is in this point is interesting, too, that... Uh it's hard to lump Iowa all together and say we're all just this way or just this way because as you look at maps that, uh, for instance, the Extension Service has put out showing the counties which are increasing in population and what has brought them in and those which are decreasing. For instance, our way, we're on the borderline uh, down there where uh, we're sort of status quo right now. We're neither leaving nor returning, so to speak. Whereas in an area in eastern Iowa where the population is rapidly becoming dense, so our problems really are very different from area to area. It's interesting to see that uh, so many of our problems seem to be similar. Don't you feel, though, that as uh, an industry comes into an area that that not only benefits the local situation, but people in outstanding or out the outer parts of the county are benefited, and That's small right. towns are benefited, as well as the south. The shows up wherever right. it is, doesn't it? It's a good move right. in the right direction, I think. Well, I'm wondering if a young man from... Uh, uh, up in that Victoria area, Jack, what do you think are the opportunities for a young man like yourself in farming or business these days? Yeah? Well, I feel that uh, there isn't uh, too much opportunity for business, however there is some. And there is great opportunity in farming, uh, however this opportunity is limited to uh, uh, ample education you must have and have all the qualities necessary to uh, have the correct management abilities that are necessary to uh, operate these large farms which are now necessary uh, in order to uh, exist. You know, what you say interests me, Jack, because <coughs> we have four sons and one daughter, and uh, uh, the, the, your experience, for instance, in coming here to Iowa State and deciding for yourself that you needed uh, that wanted further education uh, is interesting to me because it seems to me that perhaps my own sons might decide upon the same thing. Uh, was it after you arrived here that it really you began to see that you'd like further education? Yes, I uh, came here just for a winter quarter farm up uh, course in order to uh, find out actually if I would uh -huh. like college or not. And after uh, this quarter, I feel that it's very worthwhile and the new, uh, I feel like an explorer going into the new field uh -huh. all the time. one thing you can yes. do, there'll be several. Okay. Of course, I think the biggest drawback for a young fellow to get into farming, unless he has a, a father who is very, very well off financially, it's just like going into any other business. As long as we've increased the size of these farms, his initial capital outlay is almost prohibitive, which okay. uh, is another big worry, as I see it, in, in the farm industry in that your your young farmers are are just almost non-existent your average age of the farmer has really crept up there in the last few years i think that's real interesting now i've been listening to this uh jack telling about he, he is getting some more education before going back to farming now as a banker uh, mr wilson now if i were coming in to loan money to start farming would i have a better chance if i had had a college education i mean we haven't really put as much emphasis I don't feel on fellows going back into farming the need for uh, being well trained. Would, would, would a man coming in who say has uh, had a course here in agronomy and animal husbandry, would he be a better risk as far as he could say? Yeah? I would say it would uh, be one of the considerations uh, we'd have to take, but uh, a college education wouldn't be uh, considered collateral on a bank statement. <laughs> and uh, it would have to be one of the things that we would uh, have to weigh, and uh, that surely would help in his chances for success over and above someone who just happened to be forced into it because he lost a job, say, in the factory. I, I would think we would uh, we would weigh that very heavily. Uh, well, Mr. Roos, you seem to do, you, you do, I, I, I'm sure you do because you're on a payroll down there, mm -hmm. and the school system at, at Denison as a vocational counselor, eh? vocational guidance counselor. Eh? What kind of training do you recommend for a farm boy or a town boy these days? Well, first of all, boys differ in their interests and their abilities and their capacities and uh, 
it's uh, quite a difficult problem to counsel with these young fellows, and it's uh, quite a responsibility. Now, this gets us, of course, into guidance, and by guidance we mean uh, helping the individual assess their abilities and their liabilities and then try to go ahead and develop themselves just as far as they possibly can. Now, uh, naturally, people differ. They have different motivation, different desires. And uh, we don't try to tell anybody what to do. We try to show them the different ways and let them make some decisions for themselves. Now, I think that a, a young, strong boy like this fellow Jack here, who's physically fit and has the desire to want to farm and can prepare himself to be a good manager and a good farmer, uh, should go right after. I think 10 years from now, maybe in less time than that, farmers are going to come into their own. They're a very important part of our economy, and I think there's a place for them. Now then, there's other farm boys who do not have the same uh, interests. Uh, they do not have the chance to have some help from dad or grandpa or someone. Maybe they should use their background uh, in the selling field of fertilizer, seeds, feeds, or supplies to farmers. So, you see, uh, all uh, differ. We have farm boys and small town boys, too. We're testing all the time through our school's looking for ability, and we're finding some very high ability among these boys, and they should be encouraged, I think, to use those, that ability to go into fields of science and engineering and the professions. It's possible. May I ask, uh, supposing a father is discouraging his son from going into agriculture because he thinks the future doesn't look good, uh, do you try to put any pressure or do you lean on this boy in you or his dad to try to encourage them to... To go into agriculture? No, I would hesitate to uh, put pressure again, uh, the advice of the home. However, uh, I think the uh, parents have gone through several years of rather unfortunate economic conditions on the farm. They all would like to have their children do better than mm -hmm. they have. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're prone to think that the grass is greener on the other mm -hmm. side of the street. And uh, maybe they aren't too well acquainted with the grass on the other side of the street. So they should investigate this thing together, and certainly I think they should solve their own problems. I sometimes wonder if we're meeting uh, our obligation in the school. I uh, personally think we should study the possibility of area vocational schools, where in each county at least there would be one place where a boy could uh, maybe study in his hometown school for a morning, and be transported to a central location somewhere where he could study some of the vocations such as auto mechanics, body and fender work, air conditioning, carpentry, sheet metal, brick laying and whatnot, and have it to break down the lines in some way so that they could come back and forth. I see no reason why that he couldn't break the lines of reorganization in such a way that through tuition or otherwise these people could be schooled in their home school a while for part of a day and then transported somewhere else. I just throw that out for your thought. Is this done in other states? or uh, I've, This is a rather new <laughs> idea. Now, I've heard of this uh, within a city or within a town. They will release students for a uh, time to go into business, for instance. Now, we're talking about small business. Is this done in other states? We have some area technical schools. I believe there's one right here in Ames, a two-year program, where they come in and study two years in the fields of rather technical work. You see, to have one engineer working, you have to have technical assistants and suppliers and helpers. But so far, that type of school has taken a very talented mm -hmm. youngster. You mm -hmm. have to be of college caliber, as I understand it, almost, to do this type of work. I think, too, there's a similar school at Mason City. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as other states are concerned, I'm not too sure. I believe they have tried similar things, but I think it's something to be considered. I think this is a real interesting uh, suggestion you have, Mr. Root. Now, I was an agricultural state, and uh, of course, uh, in agricultural these days, we wonder, do can we uh, get along better with government health or government programs? Uh, uh, do would be better off if we didn't have any now with our tremendous uh, surpluses and one thing, another. We we sure this is a topic that a lot of you people have some definite ideas on. Now, how do you feel about uh, this? Do you think we, we're better off without any government help, or if we have some? How about it, Mr. Wilson? Well, I can say that a number of farmers in the past have been uh, very definitely against any government help. 
uh, in the way of subsidies or programs or what have you. But more and more, I, I think the farmer is realizing that the uh, thing has gotten beyond, beyond the scope of just private enterprise and supply and demand and due to the many complexities of the business that, uh, that I would say the majority of farmers, the top farmers as well as the average farmer, realizes that there has to be some kind of government program in order for them to, to exist in the economy as we know it today. I, I um, think you're probably right in that we feel a, a sense of needing help. However, uh, I do very much uh, dislike this trend whereby we feel that we can't do anything for ourselves. In other words, that the government's got to move in on us and uh, tell us how to do it and tell us what to do. Uh, to me, this is not the way our system should go. I feel it's a dangerous trend whereby the, uh, the idea that back home we don't have gumption enough to figure out our problems for ourselves and the answer to that problem. So I, I'm very much discouraged when I see complicated farm problems constantly, or farm programs, constantly being thrown at us uh, without consideration that back home there's a little sense and that uh, if given the right promotion that we can voluntarily do a lot of things. Now there are a lot of people who aren't going to agree with this and I'm sure they're sitting well, right here. Well, of course a farmer, if he's going to exist in, uh, well, if he was in an area of free competition, he could be left on his own, but where uh, other uh, groups of our society are uh, bound together by agreement and understanding and we've even seen some uh, things in big industry that have surprised us a little bit here recently. Uh, seems to me like uh, their farmers going to have to have some help. Now whether it's on a voluntary basis or whether we uh, have it on a compulsory basis, that's another thing. It hasn't worked too well in the past on a voluntary basis, I don't think. On the other hand, we don't like the big stick raised over our heads. <laughs> well, Josh, you're going. You're a young fellow who's planning on going back into farming. You must have some ideas of this. It's going to mean a lot more to you, probably, than to we people. Huh? Well, I, I definitely do think a farmer, uh, being in the minority, uh, cannot settle these uh, agricultural problems by himself. And uh, I feel he has to use. Uh, programs uh, a little differently which we have used in the past or uh, we'll probably see what we can do with our new program being that we have a new people in the White House. Well Cy, si, I'd say this uh, and I'm no expert on it but I, I think it, it almost has to be on a compulsory basis. I think it has to be on a nationwide basis. I don't think we can uh, cut our production of uh, beans and corn say that and let some other uh, part of our country uh, grow that particular commodity when when we know uh, that we can't go uh, and change back into cotton or wheat. And I think that a program has to be just as good for the grain farmer as it does for the livestock producer and as good for the tenant as it is for the landlord. Now I know that's a big order, but that's the way it ought to be. Mm. Well, I, I'm wondering, uh, I, I feel that, of course, we have had, uh, I have a feeling we should, where do we go, how long do we have government help? I mean, this I'm wondering about. I mean, I'm sure that we've had uh, some of the surplus that we have accumulated have been because of the fact we've been encouraged to uh, produce uh, partly after the war by the government, so I think that they have some obligation to help us dispose of these surpluses, but are, are we ever going to be looking forward to uh, a free economy, as uh, Mrs. Everett has said, she uh, is she likes some of it, but she still isn't so sure that she wants to have too much of it. Isn't this sort of your feeling? That's exactly it. I, I, think, I think it's a dangerous proposition when we begin to say, you do this or else. Um, I like the idea of the uh, whole farmland retirement, I, uh, where the government, uh, for instance, rents the land uh, and whole farms are taken out. Um, I think we're going to see this uh, if through education. I think this is one of our strongest points, is that our farmers need to be educated as to what this could do. For instance, we're just taking a piddling number of acres out of production now. We should be taking many more millions of you're acres gonna have, out. You're going to have the farm machinery manufacturers <laughs> on your neck. <laughs> well, I imagine they are. Well, we're doing pretty good business up there, way. Right? <laughs> well, I'm wondering about this because some of the aims of, of farm programs is something we've debated about. I've, I've often wondered why we put so much emphasis on production when we probably could put 
more emphasis on what do we do with it after we've gotten it. But I, I think that uh, there is a... With our government today, do you think, Mr. Roosh, we have much chance of getting an adequate program? I mean, we're fewer and fewer farmers. In, in the halls of Congress, we have less representation. I mean, we have re less people representing us. I think this was shown in the last election. The Midwest wasn't too important in the election. Well, we know we're outvoted as farmers, as far as that goes, but we still are an important part of the economy, and we have some sympathy among others, I feel. But I do think, as an agricultural group, we should understand that we can't expect price and be allowed to produce all that we want to produce. I don't think it's economically sound. Now the question comes, then, how are you going to guarantee price without control of production? seems to me the whole problem in farm programs is how we're going to get these controls. Now, you mentioned the fact that uh, maybe we should retire whole farms. I, I think uh, Mr. Wilson implied the fact that maybe a mandatory program of something that was compulsory might have to be done here to control these acres. And that's some of the things uh, we're fighting. We are not too sure we want, we're ready for that type of thing, but we certainly have got to face the issue. The point I'm trying to make is this that we can't have guaranteed prices, I don't think, without control of production in some way. I know one of the things that sounds real good to everybody is now we have a lot of hungry people in the world. We have a surplus. Why don't we just, the best thing we could do with it was to feed all these people. I mean, this that we'd be doing a great service to humanity. We'd get rid of our surplus. Do you think we have any possibilities in that area? Well, I think it's mentioned in these uh, very fine fact sheets which have been given to us that this would be a very small portion. Now, this doesn't really solve the problem. It still comes back to the fact that uh, as technology increases, our production is going to increase. I believe there was a statement given in there where if uh, 20 or 25 percent of our uh, top-notch, 25 more percent of our top-notch farmers use the technology available now, we'd have just much more production than we have. In other words, we aren't even using the technology we have to its greatest, fullest extent. So our problem still goes back to overproduction. Uh, speaking of that, um, I, I like to see this tied in with conservation. I, I feel that same way about land retirement, that when land is retired, uh, it is always an uh, ever-present commodity whereby in future need it is there. It worries me a little bit to see so much of Iowa's and so much of other fine, rich land going under concrete. Now, I suppose this doesn't worry some people, but this confuses me. <laughs> because I think uh, we need to consider that our land is one of the greatest resources that the United States has. I feel that way. Now, perhaps some of you don't. You probably see other things as one of the greatest resources. But I, I like to see this carefully managed. Whatever we do at a national program, I like to see this, the, the richness of our land carefully managed, and I'm not sure that when we're thinking of the almighty dollar all the time, that this is what is happening. Well, I think anyone, I, particularly people who live on the farm, of course, you have this feeling for the soil. I mean, this is something that the, you you like to take care of, and of course, you like to produce as much from it as you can, and this is our real problem, this 7 or 8 percent that we produce uh, more than we need. Uh, I think it would be, of course, a much more of a problem if we were 7 and 8 percent less than less we needed, than but I, I think that we have to, some real problems to work out. Do you feel that now we've had a program over a number of years, should we just discard that or should we build on it? And we've had a lot, heard a lot about school lunches, uh, some more help to some of these people who are employed. Do you think any of these avenues have any real promise? How about it, Jack? You, you've had some <laughs> consideration of this, I'm sure. Yes, I believe. Uh, this would solve it to some extent. However, you would have to use the uh, present uh, systems of taking land out of production uh, also. But I believe you could uh, add on the using more food for uh, school lunches and so on. And also, I think uh, what would be very advantageous would be finding new outlets and new products which would be would constitute uh, be constituted out of the farm products that we are raising now, which we have such an uh, surplus of. I'd like to throw out this, uh, as we talk about land retirement, of course that means that uh, the farmer who once occupied that land is no longer there, and uh, he is probably competing somewhere in some urban area for a job, which uh, perhaps uh, some other one is taking offense uh, because he didn't get the position that this man had. 
uh, how do you think this is going to affect our small businesses and so forth in our towns? I, uh, I see it down in uh, Oskaloosa and New Sharon. Uh, we see part-time farmers. I'm not sure that I like this trend. I think we're in the middle of a change here where in the future we'll either have full-time farmers or full-time urban dweller, uh, people. I don't think we're going to see so much of this. But uh, I just wonder what's going to happen as these more and more land is retired, more and be more people are moving into urban areas competing for jobs. What's this I don't there? believe that it's going to create a serious problem in that uh, we're making room for farmers in our community and our packing houses. I think probably 60% of those people work part-time and, and uh, work in the packing houses. Now getting to this farm program, I shouldn't get worked up about this thing because that that's something that I think uh, I've often had the theory that it may be that we're too fat and too full and too late. <laughs> uh, I believe most of the people in the world, and we're getting closer together all the time, uh, either, maybe I shouldn't say this, either envy or hate us for what we have. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to give this illustration. Up in our country, we have an Adams Ranch with six or eight sections or more. Suppose a man lived in the middle of that ranch and had everything he wanted, milk and honey and all the niceties in the world. All around, outside of him, outside the fence, are little fellas on 15 acres of land. They're hungry. How long are they going to stay outside the fence? I think this is a real interesting point. I, we had a young fellow from Indonesia visiting with us several Saturdays ago who mentioned that probably to oh, the Chinese, uh, the difference between communism and democracy was, uh, do I have enough to eat? I mean, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, this, this I think has a, this is, to me, has a real challenge. I mean, where we have, that uh, we can't find some way uh, of using the food that we produce, and we can produce more. There's mm -hmm. no doubt about yeah. it. With continuous corn in our area of the state, we have found that we can grow corn continuously on a lot of the land up there, and still. Uh, conservation practices aren't going to be hurt at all because of the fact that you do a good job. So I think that there's a real point to be considered in this. Now I'm wondering about this. We've probably gotten away from this small businessman. You've been important. listening to the this third in a series of programs on Iowa's future. Those discussing today's subject on what prospects for agriculture and Main Street have been Mr. Ralph Wilson, Vice President of the Securities Savings Bank, Marshalltown, Mrs. Lawrence Everett, homemaker from New Sharon, Iowa. Mix Mr. Rex Roosh, guidance counselor from Denison. Mr. Jack Bauschka, a farm operations student from Jackson Junction. And Mr. Cy Warren, a farmer from Fort Dodge. Iowa State University at Ames, through its Cooperative Extension Service, has provided materials for small discussion groups to meet in homes and talk over Iowa's future, just as these folks have. If you're interested in getting the free discussion aids, go to your county extension office. The next program in this series, Your Stake in Iowa's Future, will deal with the specific topic, What Prospects for Families and Communities. It is hoped that these programs will stimulate your thinking on some of the current problems we face. They're not being presented to advocate any specific course of action, but when people study the problems of a state or nation, they are better prepared to guide it as voters, as community leaders, or as legislators and congressmen. Democracy cannot be taken for granted in today's world. Each of us has the responsibility to do what he can to preserve.